Nigeria's public debt stock surged by 12.6 trillion naira between March and June 2024 amid continued depreciation of the naira, which has remained pressured despite the Central Bank of Nigeria's efforts to shore up the local currency. This sharp increase in the nation's debt burden now puts the total debt at 134.3 trillion, according to the most recent data published by the Debt Management Office. A further probe into the DMO's data disclosed that Africa's fourth largest economy has much as 363 trillion or 43 billion dollars as its foreign debt, accounting for 47% of the total debt stock. The federal government of Nigeria took the lion's share, borrowing approximately 56 trillion naira, while the 36 states and the federal capital territory has 7 trillion as their external debt. Ex existing data also shows that the Nigerian government relied more on domestic borrowings as it accounted for 53% of total debt profile, with the government taking 66 trillion and state governments having 4 trillion as their debt. Professor Ken Ife is a consultant to the World Bank and ECOWAS Commission. He joins us now to have a quick discussion on Nigeria's growing debt profile. Good afternoon, Professor. Many thanks for joining us here on Newsday. Oh, hi. Good afternoon, and thanks for having me. Of course. Now, Nigeria's debt trajectory suggests that we're approaching a potential economic crisis. At what precise debt-to-GDP ratio do you think we transition from manageable debt to a potential sovereign debt trap? Well, our Fiscal Responsibility Act 2007, which is what sets the entire macroeconomic financial framework, didn't actually prescribe any debt to GDP. It was left for the president to do so with, after within two years, but he hasn't done it since 2007. But judging by best practices, ECOWAS macroeconomic convergence criteria, that's generally expected that 40% debt to GDP is regular. Although World Bank tends to say that Nigeria can actually, in our circumstances, go as high as 50. But what we are seeing now is that even we are more than that 50. So I think we are, we are inching towards um, you know, serious uh, uh, territory you know, when it comes to that. But there were other benchmarks. It's not just the, the debt to GDP. There's also fiscal deficit to GDP, which our law recognized to, to place at 3%, but it was amended and not brought up to 4%. But when you look at the budget now, you can see that we've, we've, we've uh, gone past that. And there are quite a lot of issues we are going to look at when we, when we disaggregate those data. Well, with 53% of Nigeria's debt now attributed to domestic borrowings, how does this reliance on local markets affect the economy, particularly when we look at private, private sector access to credit? How significant is the inflationary pressure being caused by this increased domestic borrowing, especially when, we, when it's combined with the continued depreciation of the Naira? As of this morning, we're looking at a dollar to a Naira being about 1,750. Well, the... Over the last six, ten years, we've always been recommended to government to have a balance of 60-40, 60% domestic and 40% um, uh, foreign. Uh, this is rebalancing that. It used to be worse, worse than this. Actually helps out a bit because of the, the, the currency fluctuations and the devaluation of our Naira and the fact that see, if you owe money in Naira, you know, it's, it's neither here nor there because in the end of the day, the government had to go and do ways and means and printed 33 trillion. And it's like, flip it over. America is the biggest debtor all over the world. Not only is that 60% of world debt is denominated in dollar, but they owe the most. The thing is that America never will pay their debt because they will simply print more dollars. So, I mean, just flipping, flipping the argument. So, but the thing is that we, we need to be coming back more to domestic borrowing because foreign borrowing is very dicey, especially what we have chosen to do. We are chosen to go more for Eurobond, which is directly the opposite. We should be going more for bilateral low interest uh, rates, longer term, and then rather than going for the likes of uh, private uh, sector uh, uh, Eurobond that is higher, about 7-8% or more, and then you, know, you can't move anything, they are short term. The, the law says, that is fiscal, FRCA 2007 says long term borrowing concessionary funding, but more importantly, cost-benefit analysis, which means the law favors 
movement towards project financing. So where you know that there's nothing wrong in borrowing, but where you know that the borrowing is targeted to particular things that will be capable of repaying the, the money. So you could, you could gauge what it is going to do. You can see what it's going to do, the benefits it's going to add. And we are trying to avoid a situation where the main purpose of borrowing, according to the law, is for capital expenditure and human resource development. And human resource development is education, is a, a health, and is employment. It's not poverty reduction. It's no law doesn't allow you to borrow money to distribute. It's calling poverty. No, you don't, doesn't, the law doesn't allow that. So when you're not sure of the integrity of the loan, and you can't say what the cost-benefit analysis is in terms of capability to repay back or ability to repay the money and all of that, if they're all throwing caution to the wind, then there's something to worry about. Well said, Professor. Now, I'm just wondering how current debt servicing costs might compare to or compare with critical social spending in health, education, and infrastructure. And I'm wondering if you can touch on the long-term impl societal implications of this um, financial allocation. Well, this is one major area of concern. Over the last nine months, our debt servicing uh, is $3.58 billion. Now, that is very worrisome because if compared to the corresponding period in 2003, it is actually 39% higher than it was in the same first nine months of 2023. Now, the danger in this is not only that we are, we are ramping up a higher dollar-denominated loan servicing, but you are also borrowing in the same dollar in a much higher interest rate environment where it is only going to get worse. If you were in, there are some loans from World Bank or from multilateral or ADB or even from bilateral like China where you can actually get 0.5% interest for 30 years, for 20 years. So you spread that and it doesn't put you under enormous pressure. But when you take euro loan, sort of euro bond, and then you've got to have to pay that back in one year, and it's about eight, then you are piling the pressure. And then what we, we pray, we pray that this fiscal challenge doesn't affect monetary policy, because monetary policy is trying to stabilize the dollar to a point where there, there is some accretion to our reserve as coming from crude. And so we are having a lot of money now coming, over 1,000% increase in foreign portfolio investment coming in to stabilize Naira and dollar, even though it shifted towards 1,600 or whatever, but it's steady. You've closed the gap. The arbitrage is, is gone, uh, which means that those who are converting FAC the following day to dollar are just stacking up the dollar, dollarization, and not making money from it. So the moment things get much more steady, then when the CBN decides at its own time to intervene, it will be to push down the balance. And then that will force them to start panicking and sell out some of their dollar. So but we shouldn't put CBN under pressure. Because if we have this kind of thing that is going now on the budget, then it may force CBN to start bringing out some of the reserve. It's, it's accumulating over 40 billion now to begin to address uh, loan repayment, uh, for currency loan repayment. So what I say is the likes of Sukuk bond, uh, sovereign Sukuk bond is OK because it's project tied. You can actually see what you are putting that money to. So that's fine. And, uh, and then also, if you can get some of the multilateral loans that are single, uh, digit, uh, single digit, not only single digit, but are actually concessionary. Concessionary is less than 3%. So anything in that territory is helpful, much more helpful than, than what we are doing right now. All right, then. So let's talk uh, quickly about, you know, state borrowings vis-a-vis -vis federal government dominance before we let you go. With state governments holding about four trillion naira in domestic debt, how equipped are they to meet these obligations, especially considering the limited revenue generating capacity that we have in some states? And how sustainable is it for the federal government to continue to hold the lion's share of the borrowing as it, you know, and the impact that it has on, the, on fiscal federal and the economic autonomy of, 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 the, of said states? Well, you go to the law. The law places any borrowing in the exclusive, uh, in the exclusive legislative list. So it's actually the federal government that is allowed to do any form of external borrowing. So should the state want to get involved in external borrowing, it has to be at the discretion of the, of the federal government. And the federal government, of course, has its own procedures 
you know, ranging from you have to adopt a fiscal responsibility act in your state, you have to create the enabling institution, which is FRC there, you have to get, get approval of the assembly, state assembly, you have to now come and then show us that you are, the debt is going to be sustainable and then they look at your FAC revenue every month and then they look at the exposure on the loan and then they see whether it's going above 40%. They look at all of that before they agree to approve. Because the state, the federal government doesn't want a, a situation where you're outgoing because ultimately the state federal government guarantees these loans. So they don't want a situation where a state is unable to pay salaries because they are outgoing uh, in terms of loan repayment exceeded the, the threshold. So that's why they continue to be put under the lead. The state governments, they continue to be put under the lead. But of course, the, the federal government had the latitude um, to borrow and then and is exercising that. That's why you have that huge proportion of uh, foreign uh, borrowing and, and data. And don't forget that there's no, there's no space called federal government. The federal government space is concomitant with the state, with the, with the state. So the federal government is operating in the states. So some of the roads they want to build are in the states. The dams are in the states. The power is in the states. So, so that's why they, they tend to command a, a much bigger lion's share of all this borrowing, whether domestic or, 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 or external. Well, Professor Ken Ife, World Bank and ECOWAS consultant, it's been a pleasure having you here on Newsday. Thank you for your time and analysis. Thank you.